Our first speaker is John Lozier. Um, he's the professor emeritus at the University of Washington in neurology, neurological surgery and anesthesiology, past director of the Multidisciplinary Pain Center at the University of Washington, and founding member and president of the American Pain Society and the International Association for the Study of Pain. He's going to talk about what we know about pain. Okay. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I've talked about pain for a long time, and every time I do, I realize that there's so much we don't know about pain that it's sort of interesting to turn it around and look at pain from the other side. Uh, pain is a major health care issue in all the developed countries of the world, as well as particularly in the United States. Relief of pain is the primary reason why people go to doctors. Um, it's not the most common, believe it or not, the most common reason is the doctor told them to come back. <laughs> but the main symptomatic reason is because somebody hurts and wants some help with the problem. Lewis Carroll made a point in Alice in Wonderland that words can mean anything I want them to. But if that's your way of looking at things, you have difficulty communicating with another person. So I will propose that when I say pain, what I mean is the International Association for the Study of Pain's definition of what pain is. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. And the last phrase turns out to be a critically important part of the definition. And the failure to recognize that phrase has led many doctors and many patients in the wrong direction. So it's true that usually tissue damage, stubbing your toe, cutting your finger, a million other things, is the start of pain but it is not necessary that there be tissue damage for someone to have pain. Many people suffer from chronic pain in the absence of any evidence that there's a broken part or something wrong. And unfortunately, many people run into physicians and other providers who say, I can't find anything wrong with you, you must be making it up, or you must be exaggerating, or something like that. So, it's important to recognize the last phrase in there, or described in terms of such damage. And the bottom line is, if somebody says, I hurt, they do. It isn't that they have something you can find that validates the complaint, it's simply the complaint itself. Now, pain has been portrayed in literature, in music, in art. Uh, pricking one's finger produces a nice response. But pain needs to be subdivided for us to understand in many of its features. And I would first make the division between what we call acute pain and chronic pain. In acute pain, it is almost always the case that there is tissue damage. So here's a picture that would lead most people to say, that's got to hurt, because a fracture in a bone uh, like that, a femur, uh, that's a killer, that hurts like mad. And it is the case with acute pain that there is almost always an injury or surgery. Surgeons are great at causing acute pain. It's also the case that nature will usually heal the problem. The roles of healthcare providers in acute pain 
are to facilitate healing. So this poor guy with his broken femur, we would realign the parts of the femur and attach them together and put them in a cast. And you may think that the doctor's solving the problem, uh, uh, nature's solving the problem. The doctor is simply facilitating the natural processes that lead to healing, which occur with almost all injuries. The second thing we do with acute pain is we try and reduce the amount of pain that the person is getting from the region of injury. So you can do that with oral medications, you can do that with local anesthetics, you can do that with narcotics, you can do that with lots of different medicines. You can do that by immobilizing the fracture, that makes the pain much less. Third thing we try and do is to alleviate the patient's fear and anxiety. And fourthly, we prognosticate. We say, this is an injury that's going to heal. The odds of you having a permanent problem are very small. And we rely on nature to solve the problem. Voltaire was aware of that a couple hundred years ago when he said, nature cures and doctors get the credit. <laughs> okay, because most injuries will heal. And what healthcare providers do is block the pain until nature has healed it and hasten the healing process by suturing a laceration or immobilizing a broken bone. And in fact, in our healthcare system, our healthcare non-system we have in this country today, acute pain problems are usually dealt with quite well. The system is set up to deal with acute pain problems. We have all sorts of emergency medical services to transport people to facilities to uh, try and control the acute pain, minimize the tissue damage, and allow nature to do her thing. Chronic pain is a different matter. I would define chronic pain as pain that is occurring in the absence of tissue damage or inflammation, or the technical word is nociception, the detection of tissue damage. So chronic pain has an unclear relation to any particular injury. So if somebody slips on some grease at work and lands on his backside and has back pain and is now five years down the road and he's had multiple myelograms, CTs, MRs, everybody's looked in every way they can and can't find any broken part, that's chronic pain because it isn't tied to some specific injury. Chronic pain often involves injuries to the nerves or spinal cord. And we see lots of examples of pain problems where there's nothing wrong where it hurts. That sounds funny when you just say it, think about it. But for example, we see people who have a stroke that affects part of their brain and they have some numbness and tingling on the opposite side of their body and complain bitterly of pain over the entire opposite side of the body. There's nothing wrong where it hurts. You can't treat that pain by doing something to the part that hurts. The pain is because the nervous system isn't working right. There's been an injury to the nervous system. And with chronic pains of any potential origin, it is highly likely that the nervous system is not functioning the way it should normally. And messages coming from the periphery up to the brain don't result in the kind of responses that we would expect to see. And finally, chronic pains frequently do not heal themselves. Unlike acute pain where you can say reliably, this will heal. With chronic pain, you have no predictive ability to say, this is going to heal itself. 
because it doesn't deal with self. That's the simple observation. And the final observation about chronic pain is there are highly likely to be environmental and affective factors that influence the magnitude and persistence of chronic pain. For example, we know that depression is frequently associated with chronic pain and vice versa. Nobody really knows which is the chicken, which is the egg, but people who are depressed have much more chronic pain than people who are not depressed. And people who have chronic pain are much more likely to be depressed than people who don't have chronic pain. So there is a relation that is not well understood. Chronic pain is the health care problem that's costing our society. The latest Institute of Medicine report said something like $600 billion a year. It's not acute pain. Acute pain is dealt with very expeditiously at relatively low cost. Chronic pain is not. Now one can look at other subdivisions to try and make things sensible, and one of them is the problem of pain associated with cancer. It's chronic in the sense that it's present over a long time, that's certainly true. But from the way we treat it and deal with it, it's really what I would call persisting acute pain. There is ongoing tissue damage caused by the tumor that is destroying tissue every day, and so the person continues to have pain, but it is an acute pain, and it has all of the features of acute pain, and we really treat cancer pain the same way we treat acute pain. We don't treat cancer pain the way we treat chronic pain due to some injury of the nervous system or some affective or environmental feature. In cancer pain, we need prompt, effective intervention. Chronic cancer pain can also have a neuropathic feature. It can be related to injuries to the nervous system caused by the tumor or by the treatments for the cancer. But our approach to managing cancer pain is different. Partly we see that in talking about palliative care, end-of-life care, where the issue is to keep a person as comfortable as you possibly can for all symptoms, shortness of breath, pain, whatever it might be, because the end is coming. And pain management is an important part of palliative care, and again, that is basically persisting acute pain, and we manage that the way we would manage acute pain. Now, we can talk about pain, but the fact of the matter is, it's really suffering that leads people to consume health care. Suffering is what happens when the physical or psychological integrity of a person is threatened. Your integrity can be threatened because of loss of a body part. It can be threatened because your independent existence is threatened by something in the world around you. And suffering, this negative affective response, is what drives people to seek health care. And pain is only one of the many things that lead people to suffer. And we can't always assume that everybody who is suffering is doing so because of pain. There are many other reasons to suffer. So I would like to try and propose a scheme to help us look at the components of pain. And I've drawn this scheme in this onion skin fashion to try and emphasize that nociception, pain, and suffering are personal, private, internal events that one cannot measure in another human being. The only thing you and I can measure is what somebody does or doesn't do or says or doesn't say. 
pain behaviors. And all of the rest are inferences about what's going on inside of a person. Behaviors are things that an observer can measure. And that's an important concept because there is no tank into which you can put a dipstick and measure somebody's pain. All you have to go on is what the person is doing or saying or not doing, lying down, standing up, refusing to eat, whatever. Behaviors are things that we observe and can quantify and use to assess whether we're helping this person be able to lead a more normal life. So no susception, the detection of tissue damage, pain, the response in the brain to the tissue damage, suffering, the affective component of pain, are things that we talk about as if we could somehow visualize them, but you can't. They're personal, private, in internal events. Now, we live in a world that has medicalized everything, including human life. And you need to remember that people are not biologic machines. That idea, which came in the late 19th century and into the 20th century, that somehow you could understand how a person thought, felt, behave by simply using a more and more powerful microscope to see smaller and smaller pieces of somebody, that doesn't work. You cannot understand a person by examining his or her parts. We are more than the sum of our parts. And that is very important in thinking about pain. So, Good pain management. First item in good pain management is you have to listen to the patient's story to understand what's happening to the patient. And as I'm sure all of you have experienced, the average physician doesn't have enough time to listen to your story. And consequently, physicians make judgments um, based on inadequate information. And I think that <coughs> If there's anything I could do that would make pain management better is you pass a law that says you cannot see a patient with pain in less than a half hour. And even then, I think a doctor would have a hard time understanding the problem. But a 10-minute office visit, that's not any way to deal with a pain patient. Oops. Management of pain also requires more than just treating the complaint of pain in most chronic pain patients. There's a lot more going on in the person's life. It's not just that they have a pain problem. It's that, and now you can fill in the blank. They aren't employed, they don't have any income, their spouse is mad at them because of their pain behavior, they have drug-related problems, you can go on down the litany of things that are seen in people with chronic pain, and you have to address more than the complaint of pain. Indeed, I want to push it even further. If all you're measuring is the numerical pain rating score, that is, the patient says, my pain is a 7 today, and tomorrow it's a 3, the next day it's a nine. If all you measure is that pain rating score, you are failing to ask the critical question, which is, how is this person functioning? Function is the issue that we're all talking about with chronic pain. It's not the level of pain. That's a shorthand, not a good one. Chronic pain management requires helping the patient get back up to freeway speed. If you've been sitting on the sidelines, lying around on the couch all day, drinking beer, watching television, doing nothing for six months because of your back pain, you cannot go back to work the next day. 
you lack the physical and emotional stamina to do it. So you have to get the patient back up to freeway speed, so to speak. And it's often difficult if the patient has been on the sideline for a prolonged period of time. So a chronic pain patient needs more than symptom relief, actually needs a rehabilitative program to get him or her back to being able to live a normal life. If you have an acute pain problem, the physician's statement, don't walk on that sprained ankle for a few days, is not bad advice. But if you have any type of chronic problem, bed rest is awful. It doesn't matter if it's your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, your back, your knee, or anything else. Inactivity is not a remedy for anybody's complaint. Acute pain, yes, but acute pains heal days or weeks. Chronic pain, a prescription for rest or inactivity, is wrong. It perpetuates the problem. A, huh. a critical issue for most patients is recognizing that hurt and harm are not synonyms. People often stop exercising because they're worried that they have a sore back and if they do something, they're going to damage their back. Well, you can damage your back by doing something stupid, but everyday life doesn't damage backs. And hurt and harm are not synonyms. And that's a very hard idea to get across to many patients that instead of lying down every time your back bothers them, they should get up and move. So inactivity is not a good prescription for chronic pain patients. Another issue, passive therapies. By, the, by that I mean lying down and having somebody do something to you. Passive therapies may make you feel better for a period of time, but they don't solve any problems. So we strongly recommend active therapies, using your body, not putting it to sleep forever. And in a sense that passive therapies includes going into a surgeon's office and lying down on the operating room table. That's a very passive therapy. The surgeon does all the work. And in general, chronic pain patients need to do the work themselves to make themselves better. <clears throat> a standard way of phrasing that is use it or lose it. Every professional athlete knows that. In the gyms where the professional teams train, they have signs like, no pain, no gain. Okay. We're not trying to turn people with chronic pain into professional athletes, but if you don't use your brain, your muscles, your joints, you lose function. And so a remedy for chronic pain is use it or lose it. And finally, it doesn't help to tell somebody they should do something better. Information is to behavior change as spaghetti is to brick. Okay? Telling people you need to exercise more, drink less, take fewer pills, so forth and so on, that may be fine, it may make the provider feel good, but it doesn't change the patient's behavior. And you need to figure out ways of helping people to improve what they do, not lecture them about it. And in today's day and age, we have another problem that's a, mainly a physician-induced problem, and that is the number of people who are prescribed opioids, narcotics, for chronic pain. It's almost as if the healthcare system believed that somehow chronic pain meant you didn't have enough opium in your body, and that we could cure all chronic pain by putting people on narcotics. Well, let me tell you, that is a fallacious argument, and we have a huge problem 
in our country because of the rapid increase in prescription opioid diversion, abuse, and toxicity. <coughs> Opioids are not good for chronic pain, particularly high-dose opioids. So my viewpoint on opioids for chronic pain is it's a rare patient who gets good long-term pain relief from opioids. Usually the side effects are more prominent than the pain relief. And uh, I don't know the details of Jackson County, but I suspect they're the same as almost every other county in the country. Uh, a huge problem with physician-prescribed opiates emergency room visits, deaths, diversion, um, in the fruitless attempt to treat chronic pain patients with opioids. It's not a good strategy. But healthcare has never been driven by science. Healthcare is a social convention. It's part of our culture. The manufacturers of drugs and devices have realized that you can bypass the physicians who go on television and direct to consumer advertise your product and you influence the culture, you influence society. I used to have a cartoon that I can't find anymore. It shows a woman going into the doctor's office and sitting down opposite his desk and saying, isn't there a pill you can give me that'll stop my craving for pills? <laughs> that's the product of our world out there that says something's wrong, take a pill, you'll solve the problem. And uh, that is a big problem. So the treatment of chronic pain patients is one of the major costs in any healthcare delivery system. And the fact of the matter is our treatments are very ineffective. So I just thought I'd say a little bit about healthcare delivery systems. Um, I hope somebody would understand the joke of that picture, but that's maybe <laughs> so, uh, Healthcare in the U.S. has been driven much more by income than outcome. And the income is for providers, for manufacturers, um, and we talk about evidence-based medicine and saying that we want to do things that are known to be effective, but the fact of the matter is we don't have data on outcomes for the vast majority of treatments that are used. And as we collect data, it becomes more and more obvious that um, standard treatments just don't offer enough benefit to keep on using them. There's a wonderful quote from a novel by Andrew Miller. The novel is called Ingenious Pain, in which he says, all pain is real enough to those who have it. All stand equally in need of compassion. It doesn't matter how the pain started, why the pain started. If somebody is complaining of pain and suffering, they need our assistance. The fact that you can't, that the doctor can't find a cause of the pain problem should impugn the doctor's ability, not the patient's story. Okay, all pain is real. Malingering, that is deliberate, deliberately lying to a physician that you have a symptom when you don't, is a very rare phenomenon. Of course it occurs. There are crooks in every avenue in life, including the life of the patient. But it is very uncommon. Patients need to believe. And my final little comment, very famous English philosopher, <coughs> mathematician, Bertrand Russell, visited the dentist with a toothache. Where does it hurt, the dentist said. In my mind, the philosopher replied, does anybody believe that a tooth or a back is capable of hurting? Thank you.